Um, okay, I think uh, we should get going now. Um, thank you so much, everyone, for coming. Uh, of course, thank you to uh, Reva Dr. Lindsay Taylor Goodhart's um, on behalf of everyone here at Tour in Motion. And yeah, I'm really looking forward to uh, this class. And I feel like this is one that um, lends itself very well to the kind of uh, perspective that we're looking at at now I feel like you know having some knowledge of um, the way halacha works uh, you know gives one a bit uh, more perspective than uh, maybe like the general audience so I think uh, yeah this is going to be really fascinating. Thank you yes um, I first I should warn you I have a slight cough it's not Covid but it's making me cough a lot so if I stop mute myself it's because I'm coughing like crazy. So I do apologize if that happens. So today we're going to look at Islamic law. And we will indeed do a lot of comparison with halakha because we'll see it's very easy to compare Islamic law, Sharia, with halakha. Down to the names. Halakha, of course, means walking or going in the way. Uh, and Sharia means pathway or path to be followed or even some people say path to the waterhole so it's very much the same idea this is a way of life in which you go <clears throat> and like halakha sharia is a divinely anchored law that encompasses all of life not just uh things that you know might be thought of as religious but also encompasses topics that uh, might be thought of as secular topics like divorce and inheritance and crime and so on things like that very like halakha so the first thing we need to think about is where does it come from? And there is a, a sort of source theory of law developed by Islamic jurists and understanding the way law works becomes an Islamic study in its own right. It's known as usul al-fiqh, which means the roots of jurisprudence. And basically all Muslims would agree that there are two principal sources of Islamic law. And I'm going to share the and that and we'll start looking at this so the first one pretty obviously is the quran itself which you would expect and this is indeed uh the basic um basic um source for law because there are lots of laws in it there are about 600 verses that deal with legal matters about 80 of those deal with what you might call secular law things as we said like inheritance and crime but it doesn't cover everything uh, the sort of things it does cover uh, the five times of prayer, uh, fasting in Ramadan, the details of the Hajj, the pilgrimage to Mecca, uh, and provisions also for inheritance, divorce, and compulsory charity giving. We talked about that, uh, zakat. Uh, and there's a lot of things it's, it doesn't cover, it, and a lot of things it doesn't outlaw. So, for instance, it doesn't really relate tremendously to slavery. As the, you know, the Torah also doesn't ban slavery, uh, neither the Quran or the Torah do that, but there are certain regulations. Um, Muslims are prohibited from owning Muslim slaves, and they are encouraged to free their non-Muslim slaves. So that's an example of where perhaps um, it would differ from a modern law code, but again, you know, that's quite similar to the way the Torah handles the subject too. Uh, physical punishment is authorized for five criminal offenses, and we'll come back to that a bit later and look at that in more detail. So that's source number one. Uh, source number two is what's known as the Sunnah. And the Sunnah is what Muhammad did. So just as this, this cliche among evangelical Christians, you know, they say, what would Jesus do? Uh, for Muslims, it's very real. What did Muhammad do is a source of law. And that includes his specific uh, way of talking, his habits, his practices, things he seems to have approved of by not criticizing them. Uh, the way he dealt with fr friends, family, governmental issues, all those are the sunnah of the prophet, the practice of the prophet. And again, this is another word that's originally meant clear path or well-trodden path, by extension, usual practice or habit. Uh, it's a little bit like our Torah Shavu al uh, in that it doesn't come in a single book. There's no book called the sunnah. Uh, it comes mostly from the hadith, which you might remember are orally transmitted traditions about Muhammad and what he said and what he did. They usually have a chain of X said that Y said that Z said that the prophet said, and then they'll have the actual content. Uh, and there are many, many later collections and anthologies of hadith. Uh, so 
a certain amount of sunnah comes out of hadith. Some of it comes from the biography, biographies of Muhammad, a, a type of literature called the Sirah, which literally just means the life of uh, Muhammad, um, like the one by Ibn Ishaq that we already looked at in terms of a historical source of Muhammad's life. Uh, again, there we have to remember that that was written down well over a century after Muhammad had died. Uh, so again, you know, historically, who knows, but it's still a major source. And the Hadith also weren't uh, written down for probably hundreds of years. They were transmitted orally, very like the Mishnah. Also wasn't, uh, well, we don't know when the Mishnah was written down, actually. It was uh, composed, you could say, or selected in the year 200, but uh, some people, including Rashi, didn't think it got written down till about the eighth century CE. So there's certain parallels there with an originally oral tradition that doesn't get written down too much later. So what about the Hadith? There are hundreds of thousands of Hadith. Uh, not all of them are equally reliable, um, and there's an entire science of hadith in Islam uh, that will weed out unreliable hadith. Again, I'm not sure it's a science by modern scientific standards, but it's a classical science in the Islamic world. And um, many uh, very usual practices in Islam don't come from the Quran, they come from the hadith. And the best example, perhaps, is circumcision, which is usual for Muslim males, usually in adolescence. But again, that is derived from the, the, the sunnah by way of the hadith. It doesn't appear in the Quran at all. So it's not quite like a mitzvah. It's more like a practice that is good because Muhammad did it. So all Muslims would agree on those two laws, uh, two sources of law. From now on, there's much more argument, and it might depend where you are in the Muslim world and who you are as to how important you think these other sources are. So the first one is qiyas, which really means analogy. And that's a means of applying something that you know from Quran or the, the, the Sunnah to a new circumstance. Um, you could say, for instance, uh, relying on the fact that alcohol is either prohibited or discouraged very strongly in the Quran. What about hard drugs like cocaine? Can you say we can apply the prohibition on alcohol to drugs or can't you say that? So that sort of application of um, pre-existing patterns and commands to new situation. Again, this happens in Israel, uh, in, in, in Jewish law the whole time. If you think of a lot of medical ethics, a lot of that goes back to earlier ideas and then applies them to new situations that have much more recently arisen. Um, now, some people uh, were very keen or are very keen on kias. Um, if you can show that the rationale underlying a law is what would apply to the modern instance, then it seems to be fairly um, fairly sort of solid, but again, there are different schools of mus Muslim law, and they attribute different weight to Qiyas. Uh, the Hanafi school, we're going to discuss the schools in a moment, relied on it a lot. The Maliki school didn't care for it. And there's even a joke about a, a Hanafi who says, well, you shouldn't be allowed to use a wineskin on analogy with the fact that wine, as alcohol, is prohibited. And a Maliki sneers back at him, then well, we should whip all men because they carry around the instruments by which adultery can be performed. So there's a certain amount of tension within Islam about how much weight you would give to, to, to kias, to, to this idea of analogy. Uh, another one that's a little bit slippy is ijma, the consensus of Muslims on a point of law. All Muslims do X. Um, again, a lot of Sunni jurists would consist, consider that in, absolutely infallible and gives you certain knowledge because there's a hadith that's, uh, that Muhammad once said, my people will never agree on an error. So if you can say, well, everybody is doing this, therefore it must be mandatory, uh, that would look pretty good. Uh, but how do you determine what is an authoritative consensus? If one person doesn't agree, does that mean you can't say that there is ijma on something? And Shiites tend to be a little bit suspicious of it because after all, the majority of Muslims are uh, still holding to an error in their eyes. Uh, they denied the right of Ali and his family to succeed the prophet. <coughs> so um, from a Shiite point of view, uh, just because everyone agrees it's right doesn't mean it's right. So they're much more suspicious of that and they would use it much less in their practice. Then we come to Ijtihad, which is very important. Uh, Ijtihad, uh, means the effort exerted by a scholar trying to discover the intent of the lawgiver, i.e. God, in giving the law on something. So it's independent 
research and investigation to decide something. Um, it's really more about the process of finding law than the source of that particular law. And from about the 15th century onward, a lot of argument developed as whether you could still do ijtihad or whether everything had already been decided and you just had to follow precedent, which is taklid, which we'll talk about in a moment. And uh, ijtihad was very common in early Islam. Uh, both men and women scholars uh, practiced ijtihad and would come to new conclusions based on uh, basic principles. Uh, but some medieval philosophers weren't too keen on it because they felt it could lead to undesirable innovations. And in practice, uh, Sunni scholars today see that ijtihad is necessary because you have new situations coming up, but they tend to limit the scope of ijtihad to their particular methodology or their particular school. They're not very keen for it to be a generally done thing. Shiites, however, are all for ijtihad. Uh, they're, they're very enthusiastic and they have a lot of uh, qualified jurists who have the title of mujtihad, including women. And there are some very famous ones in Iran, uh, Lady Amin and Zohre Safati. Uh, Zohre Safati was born in 1949. So there are very high ranking uh, female jurisprudence in Iran who have a lot of power. Uh, the, the second one I mentioned, um, Zohre Safati thinks that women could actually rise to the highest level of the traditional clergy to the level of marja uh, and some male scholars agree with her but not all so that at the moment there isn't any woman on the top level but there are women uh, certainly the next level down and they have quite a lot of power and they definitely um, they definitely decide things for other people uh, the liberal and reforming uh, groups within islam tend to insist that ijtihad is still possible um, and they might even say that everybody has responsibility to do ijtihad themselves to determine the correct form of law after proper research themselves. So they might actually see it as an individual duty. A um, little bit possibly, um, we have elements of this in Halakha because we do have the idea of a chidush, the idea that um, scholars are empowered to use all the sources and the processes of Halakha to come up with new ideas, and new decisions. Um, so that, that is not so controversial with us, I think, but it is a bit of a talking point in, in Islam. Uh, the issue about women doing ijtihad, there is a debate again on whether uh, they can uh, do ijtihad that other people can rely on or whether it's only for themselves. But that again is uh, probably a lot more liberal than any orthodox Jewish position there, which is quite interesting. And we talked about taklid, that's adherence to authoritative precedent, doing what you've done before. Obviously, that's very important in Judaism too. Um, but if it's certainly in the Sunni world, if you're not qualified as a mujtahid, as somebody who can do independent uh, analysis of legal principles, then you have to restrict yourself to applying previously decided things, so to applying taklid. And you can't actually make any new ideas or innovations. Uh, again, you can see there's a tension between taklid, doing what we've always done, and ijtahid, struggling with the possibilities to come up with something uh, new and independent. So there is that sort of tension in the whole system. Um, in the absence of much emphasis on ijtahid, most current Sunni jurists do rely on taklid principally. So that would be a Shiite-Sunni difference, that uh, Shiites would be more committed to ijtahid, and Sunnis would, generally speaking, be more committed to taklid, except perhaps the more reformist end of things, where there'd be more emphasis on ijtihad. We could just go through the others, which are sort of principles uh, which may or may not apply. Um, istihsan is the application of a jurist's personal judgment, which allows somebody to depart from usual strict application of, of analogy, uh, it might be his ethical principles or what he see, uh, what seem to be best. And again, this is something that's picked up by a lot of liberal movements within Islam, saying that, say, uh, human rights or women's rights should be part of this istihsan principle and they should uh, influence the jurists to, to uh, decide a particular way. Uh, conservatives would, of course, expect jurists to use conservative ideas and values and principles. So that one's a little bit more up for grabs. Uh, then we have a related uh, uh, concept, istisla, which is considerations of the public good, maslaha. Uh, what is good for the community? Again, that's a feature that's, that's well known in, in halakha. Uh, in Egypt, 
This principle has been upheld by their Supreme Con Constitutional Court, which ratified some more equitable measures uh, regarding women, even though they've actually contradicted some older and stricter readings of classic Sharia. Uh, maybe a little bit like Takanot by rabbis, like Rabbeinu Gershom doing a Takana forbidding polygamy for Ashkenazim, um, where people say, okay, you know, there is a, a, it's for the public good to make this new ruling. Um, again, that's not so easy to do now in Halakha, but that sort of principle does lie behind that sort of thing. Uh, the last two, Darura is the principle of necessity, according to which something that is law is suspended temporarily. That's very like our Sha'at Dachak, a sort of emergency hour. So Sha'at Dachak, you know, when there are unusual circumstances, uh, certain things can lapse. So in, in um, Islamic terms, so for instance, if you were starving and the only thing available to eat was pork, you could eat pork because the principle of Darura would say, well, if there is no alternative, um, better you should eat pork than die. And again, there are parallels in halakha that if you're in extreme circumstances, uh, one of the best known, of course, is the principle that uh, saving life overrides Sabbath restrictions. So if you need to get to hospital on Shabbat, yep, something can drive you, that's absolutely fine. In fact, it's mandatory because Pekuach Nefesh uh, would uh, deflect the restrictions of Shabbat. And the last principle, which uh, is, used not to be thought of so much, but is definitely in the midst of a revival, is Makasid al-Sharia, the aims and the objectives of the law, which might override other elements. And that's somewhat like, uh, in the Jewish world, metahalachic principles. So you will hear occasionally um, a, a Polsek, a decisor, saying, well, yes, I know X, I know Y, but we have this principle of, say, the respect for, for, for humanity or respect for other people, and that would override this in the current circumstances. So again, you can see parallels there, the ideas of the, of the, the meta themes, the meta objectives, what the law is really about, and where sometimes uh, legal traditions can be modified in order, order that the objectives, the ultimate objectives of a religious legal system can be met. So uh, you can see there, though it's not a one-to-one -one correspondence, there's a lot of stuff that's very, very parallel to halakha, and the way that uh, Islamic jurists think is quite parallel to the way rabbis think. It's uh, not a million miles away. There's nothing quite like it in Christianity. Uh, even canon law is quite different. Uh, it doesn't have this, this, quite, this array of using the sources and a certain amount of judgment, but relying on precedent and then various principles that can be applied in quite this way. Okay, so that's the, and I've just put a little note down the bottom that women have often been leading mujtahids and legal scholars of other types and still are in the Shiite world, which is not paralleled so much in Orthodox Judaism, one could say. Uh, let's look at the different schools of Islamic law. This is a bit different from us. Um, early Muslim jurists didn't agree on everything, no surprise there. And they eventually tended to cluster together in groups or schools which tended to form around one particularly outstanding jurist. And there are four principal Sunni schools, they're called the Madhab, and they are the Hanafi, Maliki, Shafi'i, and Hanbali schools. I put in one of the Shiite schools, there's more than just the one, but that's the main one. Uh, but we'll talk first of all about the four Shiite schools. So you can see that they are operative in different places, uh, so, for instance, Saudi Arabia and Qatar and most Salafi groups around the world will go, go for the Hanbali school of law, which is the strictest and most conservative. Um, our part of the world, Shafi and Hanafi are both around. Um, North Africa, a lot of Malikis. Uh, I should think your average Muslim in the street isn't always sure what their local tradition is, but anyone who's had uh, some sort of uh, Islamic education will probably know which uh, law school they, they or their family follows. Uh, the differences are very often on practical questions, like how exactly do you perform the salat, the ritual prayer, where do you put your hands at the beginning, you know, there are different options. Uh, how do women do prostration might be a different thing between different, um, different groups. Uh, whether or not you can eat shellfish, uh, there is one group, and I've forgotten if it's Maliki or Shafi, but one of them prohibits shellfish and the other three don't. And that's, but they're fairly uh, in small things like styles, emphasis, and some smallish things. It's a bit like the difference between Safadi and Ashkenazi, but a bit more formal. A bit like it's sort of at the level of can you or can you not eat kidney out on Pesach? 
uh, it, it tends to be that rather than massively different uh, approaches like Sunni and Shi, which are very, very different uh, because they've got a whole theory of uh, correct ruling of the community. So these are more, um, you could go through life as a Muslim not being too sure which one you belong to. If you just did what your community did, it might not come up all the time in your life. But the development of these four Sunni schools that survived, there were other ones that aren't around anymore, and of course the, the various Shi ones, um, they, the, they, they developed, as you can see, quite a long time ago. They've been around for over a million, yeah, millennium. So they have together given rise to a huge and varied, very creative legal world with thousands of classical texts and commentaries on those texts and famous jurists. And it's actually even larger than the body of halakhic literature. And if any of you are familiar with the body of halakhic literature, you know, it's absolutely enormous. Well, the Muslim one is even bigger because you know, historically there'd be more Muslims basically. And uh, they'd have to find to write more books and there are quite literally thousands and thousands and thousands of these. So I think people tend to be an expert within their particular school. They may know differences in the other schools, but they will probably, there's just so much material you would be forced really to, to, um, to rely on the products of your own school and the things that were relevant to your own school. And the way this works is students study at the feet of a, of a master. It's often still very oral. Uh, people used to and still do often tra uh, travel huge distances to go and study with somebody they know about who they really want to learn from. And students then receive personal licensing from the master. It's called ijaza. Uh, and it's usually uh, related to a particular text. They have ijaza to teach this legal text or, or a particular field. They have ijaza as a master of, of hadith or they have ijaza as a master of this field of law or what have you. So it's, it's a bit like smicha. But uh, in the case, uh, though, of course, in Judaism, you can get smicha from all sorts of different people. Uh, and many rabbis do have smicha for more than one person um, or institution indeed. Um, in Islam, it's not institutional, it's, it's personal and people will collect, uh, they will collect ijazas from different people in different areas to round themselves out as proper scholars. Um, and this leads, uh, there are all sorts of fields within law uh, that people specialize in or have particular expertise in. So the study of law itself, what in English is called jurisprudence, is known as fiqh. And uh, somebody who is a master of fiqh is a faqi. Uh, that's that one down there. Uh, not everybody by any means is a faqi. You have to be pretty good at this stuff. Uh, you could have expertise in Quranic commentary and tafsir. Uh, that wouldn't make you a faqi. It would make you a, a qualified scholar in tafsir. And this is roughly how the system has always operated and still does. Uh, there are specialist terms, uh, as you would expect. So a qadi is a judge, very much like a dayan. Uh, a mufti is rather like a posik. It's a scholar who can give a legal decision, a fatwa. And a fatwa is a legal ruling. And in Judaism, the exact correlate would be a tshuva or a psak din. Uh, you would go to, just like you would go to a posek to get uh, an opinion, you'd ask them a she'ela, a shayla, and they'd give you a tshuva or a uh, So in Islam, you would go to a mufti, and he would give you a fatwa. So there's nothing uh, sinister about the word fatwa, it just means legal decision. The plural is fatawa. And uh, we're going to have fatwas on all sorts of things, like, I don't know, fatwas on uh, whether you're exempted from fasting this Ramadan because you have a medical condition, or you could have a, a fatwa saying, uh, you know, restaurants can't sell this sort of meat or all sorts of things. So, so there's nothing, it's, it's not a sinister term at all, it's just a technical term. And there are other terms uh, for specialists, like muhaddith is somebody who's expert in hadith. The general term ulama just means religious scholars, regardless of their expertise. So that's the most general term for any of the above scholars who are trained in a particular field of Islamic law, or who act as judges, or who uh, act as uh, fukahi, as experts in fiqh, and, and, and give opinions. Um, the term imam has a much wider meaning. Uh, imam can just be the person who stands in front when you pray, a bit like a bal tefila for us. Uh, imam can be a term of respect for a scholar that's not very precise. Uh, and for the Shiites, the Imam is the authorized head of the entire Muslim. <coughs> <coughs> Sorry, 
Muslim community, which of course they haven't had since the ninth century. So Imam is a rather slippery word. It has, means different things in different contexts. Okay. So we'll move on to some of the basic legal categories. And here, I think the similarities with uh, Judaism are quite amazing, actually. And it certainly means that once you get talking to Muslims about Sharia, there's just so much, so much doesn't need to be translated. We just sort of get it. So we send the main job of a mufti or an expert scholar is to determine the status of different activities. Very like Jewish poskim or halakhic decisors, they get asked a lot of questions all the time. And in replies, we said they give a, a fatwa, a decision, uh, like our shuva opasak. And there are basically two types of what we might think of as commandments, which are very like the Jewish classifications. There are the ibadat, the religious duties, which we would call mitzvot ben adam lamakom, commandments that are between human beings and God. And there are the mu'alamat, the legal duties, which exactly corresponds to our classification of mitzvot ben adam la adam, commandments between humans. So that's an exact parallel there, which I think is just fascinating. You know, there, are, there are these two uh, parallel divisions. And again, rather like us, uh, you can classify human activity uh, in different ways. In Islam, there's a, a formal system of five ways. Ours is a little bit less um, formalized, if you like. And some of them are actually quite parallel to Jewish ideas. So an action might be obligatory, wajib. That's very parallel to our chova or chiyuv, in doing something. It could be mandub, which is recommended, but you don't have to do it. That would be rather like our categories of adif, preferable to do something, uh, in the best case, you know, a priori you would do it this way, or even mehuda, this is a nice way of doing this particular mitzvah or activity. Uh, then you have in the middle muba, which means neutral. I don't think we have a category like that one, actually. I don't think that's actually, I can't think of a term in halakha that just means we don't care who can do that. Um, makru, discouraged which might be perhaps uh, the avad in some cases, or migune even, uh, sort of, you know, second best options. And then you have haram, which means prohibited, which is equivalent to our asur, forbidden to do something. So again, the parallels here are pretty close. Uh, the, the structure of the system is recognizable to Jews, shall I say, in a way that it, it just isn't Christians. You know, Christians don't get halakha, they don't get sharia either. Uh, but Muslims work with a lot of these categories, even if they're by no means expert, like most of us are not expert in halakha, but we know the, the parameters of what you're talking about. We have this idea of being commanded, we have this idea of different statuses of activities and different categories of activities. And that is all actually very, very similar. So we're going to move on to thinking about uh, Sharia and the state and how that has played out. Um, and as early as the early development of the caliphate, uh, Sharia wasn't necessarily applied 100%. Uh, it was mostly reduced to the mu'alamat part, the, the between people part, and it generally was reduced to personal law, uh, marriages, individual rules for businesses, things like that. Uh, penal law was not actually developed any further, it was just discussed in theory, and the state decided what happened in terms of penal law. The state tended to invent its own penalties for things like robbery and theft and kidnapping and all the rest of it, and didn't necessarily apply Sharia at all. And then things began to change um, later on in the, um, in the, really in the 19th and 20th centuries, we talked about how uh, the impact of the Western world moving into previously Islamic areas and, and the sort of hitting of modernity really, really impacted on traditional Muslim societies. And one of the places it affected most of all was the legal realm. Um, and the 19th and early 20th centuries were marked by a considerable loss of authority and influence of the ulama, of the, of the trained scholars in most Islamic states, very much partly as a result of Western colonization, because traditional Islamic legal institutions were often replaced with Western models and uh, Islamic centers of learning were closed down. So in India, for instance, the British introduced what they call anglo mohammedan law, which was really a British sort of thing made up with a, bit, a couple of bits of Sharia shoved in it, but most of it was British law. And that was just imposed on the Muslims of India. 
uh, didn't really have a very close relationship with Sharia law. Uh, after in the sort of post-colonial period, a lot of secular Arab governments also were not interested in bringing about the ulama to have any sort of legal authority or moral authority at all. And they often nationalized religious institutions. Uh, there was a system of uh, supporting religious institutions by giving donations that would continue, you know, setting up a trust fund basically, uh, known as waqf. And a waqf could be in charge of a particular place or a waqf could be the endowment for a, a traditional Islamic college, a madrasa. Uh, we have the same sort of thing called a hekdesh. I don't know if you're familiar with hekdeshim because they, they're not around so much anymore, but uh, Jews used to give money uh, in perpetuity to set up a hekdesh, say for the elderly or for uh, pilgrims to Jerusalem, or whatever it might be. And this was very common in the Muslim world too. So a lot of the religious colleges were supported by Wats and a lot of those were nationalized by secular Arab governments or governments in, in Islamic areas after colonial powers had left. So for instance, in 1961, Nasaput Al-Azhar University, which itself was a waqf, uh, under the direct control of the state. And that was you know, worldwide for, for, for Muslims. Al-Azhar is probably one of the oldest and most prestigious uh, universities, Islamic universities in the world. So it was now state control, it still is state control. In Turkey, all the traditional Islamic schools and the uh, Sufi orders, possessions, they had monastery-like places and pilgrim houses and so on. So uh, they were all dissolved and replaced by state-controlled schools in the 1950s and 1960s. Uh, same thing happened in Algeria. The uh, Algerian ulama were, uh, were pushed out of any authoritative positions at all. And the result was a, a crisis and in fact a vacuum of religious authority in the Muslim world. And this was very much the background to some of the radical reformers of the early 20th century that we talked about, people like Rashid Rida and Muhammad Abdul. Um, what they were actually li quite liberal reformers and they wanted to reinterpret Sharia to make it more responsive to modern culture and to modern challenges like women's rights, uh, civil and human rights and democracy. Uh, not all of them were, but some of them were very much working in that sort of direction. Uh, in most cases, their ideas remained theoretical because of the political context in which they were working, but they have had important influences on more recent liberal and reforming scholars who've revisited some of their ideas on um, certainly reform of Sharia, but maybe adaptation of Sharia to the modern world. So what happened with this vacuum of religious authority, uh, eventually it tended to be filled not by trained ulama who knew what they were doing, but a whole load of untrained enthusiasts who didn't have any classical legal training, but had very strong uh, political and pietistic views, especially Salafi groups, we talked about them before. Um, very, very often what happened was they had no knowledge of and no interest in the vast development of medieval Islamic legal systems, uh, you know, be the equivalent of just dropping everything from the Talmud on in Judaism. Um, and very often these groups uh, wanted a return to the practice of the prophet, which meant ignoring everything that had happened afterwards, which meant ignoring classical Sharia. And just going, well, I'm just going to look at the Quran, the Sunnah, that's it, I don't need anything else. I don't need to look at any medieval jurist. I don't need to look at how this developed. I don't need to look at how this was practiced. I'm just going to go back and interpret for myself what the Quran says and what the Sunnah says. So that meant that you had a lot of people who didn't have a classical training um, who came up with some pretty fierce ideas. Um, there hasn't been anything like that in Judaism. I think the closest is the Karaites who wouldn't accept anything rabbinic. So they just, uh, they, they just rely on Torah and they're actually quite enthusiastic supporters of what would be called Ijtihad in the Muslim context of uh, individuals interpreting it for themselves. But you can see the problems with individual interpretation and no development uh, from literally the words of the Torah, that's going to leave you with quite a gap. And it might leave you with quite a, a fierce and radical legal system. And, you know, just think of some of the, uh, some of the aspects of, uh, of uh, the, the pshat, the simple meaning of Torah, which for us are modulated by rabbinic interpretation. Uh, just think of eye for an eye. It's the rabbis who tell us eye for an eye doesn't mean you whack somebody's eye out, it means monetary compensation. But if you took away the rabbinic tradition, you'd back, be back to eye for an eye. And this is what happened to some extent in the Muslim world very much. 
Um, in many cases, secular Muslim rulers uh, did encourage these much more radical back to the profit groups uh, to combat leftist and Marxist groups and to give themselves a sort of respectable Islamic coloring. But after uh, the 1979 Iranian revolution, a lot of rulers realized that these rather Puritan movements were actually quite dangerous to them and they started suppressing them. And that radicalized a lot of those movements and that's what we're seeing today. So what happens in practice is Islamic revolutionary movements like the ones we discussed a couple of sessions ago often criticize existing governments in Muslim countries precisely because they don't follow Islamic principles, but they often don't have a concept themselves of what are the principles for an Islamic government because it's all back to the Quran and ignore the entire development of Muslim law from then on. And the Muslim states that have tried to build Sharia into their constitutions are all completely novel in form. And they differ immensely from each other. And if you just think about Iran, Saudi Arabia and Pakistan, you can see they're not coming up with the same forms of law at all. Uh, liberal Muslims would argue they're misusing Sharia by making it part of the state. And I've got a nice little quote here from Khaled Abu al-Fadl, who um, I think lives in America. He's head of something called the Usuli Institute and uh, writes a lot of really interesting stuff. He says, to date, Islamist models, whether in Iran, Saudi Arabia or Pakistan, have endowed the state with legislative power over the divine law. For instance, the claim of precautionary measures blocking the means to perform evil acts, and there is a statement in the Quran that says, forbid what is evil, is used today in Saudi Arabia to justify a wide range of restrictive laws against women, including the prohibition against driving cars, which they actually just recently reversed, but certainly that was I think, last year. This is a relatively novel invention in Islamic state practices, and in many instances, amounts to the use of Sharia to undermine Sharia. Traditionally, Muslim jurists insisted that the rulers ought to consult with the jurists, with the ulama, on all matters related to law. But the jurists themselves never demanded the right to rule the Islamic State directly. So for instance, in Iran, where you have the rule of the clergy, that is a complete innovation, absolutely unprecedented in the Muslim world. In fact, until recently, neither Sunni nor Shi'i jurists ever assumed direct rule in the political sphere. Throughout Islamic history, the jurists, the ulama, performed a wide range of economic, political, and administrative functions. But most importantly, they acted as negotiated mediators between the ruling classes and the laity. While they legitimated and often explained the rulers to the ruled, the jurists also used their moral weight to thwart tyrannous measures and at times led or legitimated rebellions against the ruling classes. Modernity, however, has turned the ulama from vociferous spokesmen of the masses into salaried state functionaries who play a primarily conservative, legitimist role for the ruling regimes in the Islamic world. So these are sort of co-opted by governments, some of which are secular, some of which are not. The disintegration of the role of the ulama and their co-optation by the modern state with its hybrid practices of secularism have opened the door for the state to become the maker and enforcer of the divine law. In so doing, the state has acquired formidable power that has further ingrained the practice of authoritarianism in various Islamic states. So what you're seeing now in countries that claim that they're implementing Sharia law is nothing like any earlier Muslim society that was using Sharia law as part of its legal practice and probably not as all of its legal practices. And this idea that the clergy have this political role is completely, completely new. So I want to move on now to something that often gets talked about, and that is uh, the moment you mention Islamic law, lots of people think about beheadings and amputations and stonings and summary killings. So where does this come from? Is there actually any basis to this impression of Sharia? Well, the Quran does indeed specify corporal punishment, including the death penalty, for four types of behavior. You may not know this, but so does the Torah. The Torah specifies 22 types of behavior, including hitting your parents and desecrating for Shabbat, which carry the death penalty. Uh, so that possibly puts the Quran in perspective. They only have four, as opposed to our 22 uh, mandatory death penalties. And actually, we'll see that not all of the death penalty. In addition, in cases of murder or physical abuse, 
The Quran allows the victim's relatives to retaliate with the same degree of violence, so, which is the eye for eye principle, but it recommends that the relatives act with mercy and forgive the murderer, which is not an option in the Torah. So let's have a look at what the Quran actually says. So, and these are known as the hudud or boundary penalties. <coughs> the first one is theft. So the text says, as to the thief, male or female, cut off his or her hands, a retribution for their deed and exemplary punishment from God, and God is exalted in power, full of wisdom. But if the thief repent after his crime and amend his conduct, presumably we are paying back what they've stolen, God turns to him in forgiveness, for God is oft forgiving, most merciful. Now there is dispute about this because some scholars say, well, there's something very odd in the Arabic here. It mentions male and female thief, but it doesn't use the dual form of the verb. Now we have duals in Hebrew as well, things like misparayim, mifnasayim, mishkafayim, uh, and in biblical Hebrew there is there are dual forms it's barely ever used nowadays, and the same uh, exists in Arabic, except they're still using their dual forms. Now you would expect the dual for male and female, but it doesn't. Uh, it just goes on to the plural. So from that and from the, uh, the, con the, the use of the phrase cutting off hands, some scholars have actually uh, included that it doesn't mean literal cutting off hands, it's just a metaphor meaning restrictive measures. You impose some measure that will stop them stealing again. This would be rather like our rabbinic interpretation of eye for an eye saying that it's not literally an eye for an eye, it is monetary compensation of the worth of the eye and the suffering endured, for the eye that is lost. So again, uh, there is dispute within Islam about what that one means. Next one doesn't seem so disputed. Uh, this is fornication and adultery, which come out of the general term of zina, which again is uh, pretty close to a Hebrew root. The woman and the man guilty of adultery or fornication flog each of them with a hundred stripes. Let not compassion move you in their case in the matter prescribed by God, if you believe in God and the last day, and let a party of, their, of the believers witness their punishment. Okay, so that's not the death penalty. I mean, it's not much fun, 100 stripes, but okay, it doesn't actually say death penalty. Uh, in Judaism, both parties are, are killed, they're burnt. So lots of parallels there. Then we have the false accusation of fornication, because of uh, those who launch a charge against chaste women and produce not four witnesses to support their allegations, Flog them with 80 stripes and reject the evidence ever after. For such men are wicked transgressors, unless they repent thereafter and mend their conduct, for God is oft forgiving, most merciful. Now, there is a parallel to this in the Torah, and that is not just restricted to charges of fornication, but any plotting witness, it's an Edzoem, who tries to uh, get somebody else convicted of a crime they didn't commit, uh, themselves receives the penalty that they were hoping that the innocent victim was going to get. So if they are uh, plotting against somebody and claiming falsely that they committed a crime that is punished by death, that witness himself would be executed. So again, uh, the Torah version is slightly fiercer than this. Uh, also, it doesn't have the option about if they repent, they can be forgiven. That's just not an option in the Torah. The fourth one is the waging of war against Islam or spreading disorder in the land, that's Haribah, and the punishment of those who wage war against God and his messenger and strive with might and make mischief throughout the land is execution or crucifixion, which in this context means being hung from a cross, not nailed to a cross, or the cutting off of fans and feet from opposite sides, or exile from the land. That is their disgrace in this world, and a heavy punishment is theirs in the hereafter, except for those who repent before they fall into your power. In that case, know that God is oft forgiving, most merciful. So again, we have uh, what looks like death penalties here, but we have an opt-out clause if these people repent, in which case they don't receive the death penalty. Uh, this one, I don't think we really have anything very parallel in the Torah at all. In addition to those four, and those are known as the hudud, punishments, uh, we have this extra one, vengeance for violence, kisos. And this again is, if uh, this is again in a very tribal society, we ordained therein for them, probably means the Israelites, life for life, eye for eye, nose for nose, ear for ear, tooth for tooth, 
and wounds equal for equal. But if anyone remits the retaliation by way of charity, it is an act of atonement for himself. And if any fail to judge by, by, by what God has revealed, they are wrongdoers. So here we have the opt out. If the relatives of the person who has been injured or hurt uh, forgives the perpetrator, uh, then the sentence is not carried out. Now we have a rabbinic uh, reading of Abshat, which doesn't mention any forgiveness at all, um, but the rabbinic reading of Abshat says, uh, says it's a uh, monetary compensation. So there we seem to have gone in a somewhat different direction. So that's, uh, that's what there is in the Quran. Those are the texts, basically. <coughs> <coughs> Sorry. Again, uh, in the case of the eye for the eye, nose for the nose bit, um, except for modern Saudi Arabia, those penalties weren't usually applied. Um, again, most uh, traditional scholars in the Islamic world interpreted this as financial compensation, rather like Jews. So again, a lot of what you're seeing now is probably quite different from what happened in classical Islamic societies. The one that you haven't seen here, because it's not in the Quran, is the one about drinking alcohol. Uh, the Quran either discourages or prohibits the drinking of alcohol, and there is debate among Islamic scholars which that is, but the, the very commonly known punishment today of 40 lashes or 80 lashes doesn't come from the Quran at all. It comes from hadith uh, recorded in a particular collection uh, which records Muhammad and his cousin Ali both ordering a drunk to be flogged. Uh, similarly, the punishment of stoning for adultery, which is done nowadays in some very extreme cases, uh, that's based on hadith. It doesn't come in the Quran whatsoever. So what about how these were applied? Well, in classical Jew um, Islamic Jewish prudence, it was very difficult to actually impose these penalties. They usually had to be four adult male Muslim witnesses. We can compare that with halakha, where capital punishment usually requires two adult male Jewish witnesses. So actually the, the standards are somewhat stricter than four witnesses. Uh, they actually have to see the actual act. And jurists were encouraged to drop the penalties if there was any doubt whatsoever, and if you couldn't satisfy that standard of evidence, which is again very much the same in the Jewish world. Uh, you might remember the Talmud says that a Sanhedrin who, in, uh, who executed one person in a generation was called a murdering Sanhedrin. I, it didn't happen very often because the standards of evidence were so high. So historically, these penalties were not actually applied very often. Apparently, in the whole of Ottoman history, which is a good 400 years, there's one record of Estonia. So, how is it you hear about them all the time now? The answer is they've only been revived and put into practice in modern times. They're not an ancient Islamic practice. They, they ignore all of the medieval interpretation that tended to downplay them and make them impossible to apply, just as Jewish interpretation of the, the uh, simple meaning of the Torah was applied. And this is really, they've been applied as part of the modern fundamentalist or Salafi side of Islam, which goes, let's just go back to the Quran and do what it says there, and I don't want to know what the medieval scholars say. And the first instance uh, was the stoning of four people convicted of adultery in Iran in July 1980. There were a lot of shootings and hangings going on as part of the revolution, but nobody ever claimed those were part of the Hadud penalties, by the way. Uh, stoning itself is not mentioned in the Quran, and the relevant Hadith material is quite open, leads to a lot of questions. In 1979, the then leader of Pakistan, Zia al -Huk, enacted four Hudud ordinances and put this into the constitution of Pakistan. 1981, Saudi Arabia, uh, Saudi Arabia changed their law and they adopted a minority view from the Malachite school, which is odd because they're usually Hanbali. Uh, and so all sexual abductions and armed robberies and drug offenses should be punished by execution. That was made up by Saudi Arabia in 1981. By the end of the 1980s, Mauritania, Sudan, the UAE, um, had all enacted laws to, uh, to allow courts to impose these penalties. In Somalia, Yemen, Afghanistan, and northern Nigeria followed in the 1990s. Saddam Hussein introduced amputation for theft in 1994. So it's a modern phenomenon. It's not actually a classical Islamic phenomenon at all. So if the standards of evidence are so high, however, for these, then how are they being imposed? And here we have another little wiggle in the Islamic system that actually explains how they are justified in these contexts. Now, we've seen there are these four hudud penalties, and we've seen the additional vengeance 
optional when it's by relatives of the victim. There are other two types of penalties. One is dia, which is blood money, when you pay somebody for damage. And the other one is called tazir. Now, tazir is a discretionary punishment that a court can assign if a crime doesn't seem to be dealt with in the Quran. So, you know, if, if it's not covered in the Quran, the court can decide what to do about it. And there are much, much lower standards of evidence for tazir offenses, only two witnesses, for instance, not four. And they are discretionary, so that it's up to the court to choose whether to apply them or not, and what those penalties should be. So that is the, if you like, loophole in the Islamic legal system that allows modern states to say, fine, we're going to put these in practice, we'll call them tazir. They're not the original hudud, but we're going to do, we're going to interpret the Quran directly, and we're going to say, okay, that comes under the heading of tazir, discretionary punishments, and we're going to make them mandatory. So we're now we're going to say that courts have to order execution for these crimes. And that is how they've got into practice in the modern world. And again, it's sidestepping the entire classical Islamic legal tradition of the Middle Ages and going direct from the Quran to modern interpretations, or some people would say misinterpretations. And liberal Muslims would argue that tazir penalties should never include the death penalty or amputation. So that just cannot be a tazir penalty. You just can't do that. So again, not all Muslims support the introduction of those particular interpretations of food for Quranic hudud penalties. And I'd like to end up with a liberal vision of what Sharia should be and how it should be applied, because I think actually this will resonate in terms of halakha as well. And again, I've gone back to Khaled Abu Fadl because he writes well. Uh, this is part of his book, The Search for Beauty in Islam, which is a set, series of sort of meditative essays on different Islamic aspects. And he, he writes it in an autobiographical way. He talks about his own teacher, his, his shaykh, his uh, uh, honoured teacher, I think that's the translation. The Shaykh again nodded his head and said in a matter of fact way, I always remind you that when presented with a legal question, first you expend your best efforts investigating the evidence and the precedents. After you have done your homework, there always remains the question, what is the most merciful? What causes the least hardship? What is in the public interest? Yours, which is uh, we've looked at before, is start this is start here. Your response to any of these questions should tip the balance in determining your choice of law. In all cases, you are under a duty to achieve the objectives of the law, which are compassion, mercy, and justice. And thus, you might have to fashion a solution in response to each particular case, each case with its own specific elements. But what you cannot do is to mechanically apply a set of rules without asking yourself, and am I fulfilling the objectives of Sharia in serving the public interest and achieving justice? Always remember, you are not applying the rules to corpses. You are applying the rules to living beings, and this means the law must be as alive as those who are bound by it. In the years I spent with the Sheikh, the single most important lesson I learned is that the essence of God's law is justice, compassion, and mercy. If it is not, this necessarily means human beings abused it and deformed it into becoming what is at odds with the beauty that is God's nature. So I think that's quite an interesting idea about uh, how law is to be applied. And uh, if you ask any for sake, they would recognize a lot of that, the idea that you cannot apply one set of rules to everybody, that you must look at the context of the case that is coming before you and take all of that into account. And you must take into account what benefits people the most and what is uh, the least harmful and what calls the least distressed people. And uh, it's in responsible institutions teaching halakha, they will say things like, um, if you just read the Shulchan Aruch and apply it, that is malpractice. You must research all the possibilities. You must ask questions to understand what's going on. You must investigate thoroughly. And you must take each case on its own merits. You cannot apply a one size fits all. So I think those elements are probably common to both halacha and sharia when well practiced. But uh, as we've seen, uh, there's a lot of potential, probably in both systems, I can't really express it about halacha, but certainly in sharia there's major potential for malpractice or for the, um, the thoughtless, uh, ignoring of, of internal traditions and just uh, a sort of crude reversion back to 
personal interpretations of primary material without looking at what happened in between. If you're interested, I'll put a couple of uh, uh, books on the bottom here. Both those are very good. Well, one's just a chapter, but it's an excellent book altogether. And the other one is um, extremely clear and, and easy to use as well. So um, we've got a couple of minutes. So I am going to go to the chat and see if we've got any questions. <clears throat> uh, Sol's asked, could it be that the remarkable similarities to Halakha came about in Baghdad and Babel in general in the interaction between the Talmudic rabbis and Islamic scholars? Uh, I think it's not unimaginable. <clears throat> um, I don't know if anyone's looked at it carefully. Uh, there's no doubt at all that the Jews of post-Islamic Babel spoke Arabic and uh, probably were talking to local Islamic scholars and would have had a lot of commonality and might well have discussed uh, you know, issues that came up in both things. I, I don't know, I'm not sure if anyone has actually done any uh, research on it and it will be a fascinating topic to look at. Uh, we do know in other places where Jews lived among Muslims, there was uh, a certain amount of, um, uh, there was a certain amount of, sort of cultural communication. So for instance, there you can, uh, when we get onto Sufism, we'll find that um, Sufism did influence some aspects of medieval Jewish mysticism. It's quite clear and it was acknowledged and uh, they were reading the same texts. So it's not really surprising. Uh, but on the legal field, I do, I'm sorry, my, my knowledge just, runs out here, but I think it's not impossible that um, people were using two fairly similar systems were perhaps thinking about issues in some of the same ways. Any other questions at all? We usually have lots of questions, I can't believe it, only, only one. <laughs> Get some more in quick. Honor killings Whoa. are then actually not permitted? No, they're not permitted at all. No form of Islamic law says you can take law into your hands and kill somebody for the heck of it. All forms of Islamic law say you have to go to a court. So no, they're completely, completely uh, not permitted by Islamic law. Question two would be, okay, if you took this person to, to an Islamic court, what would they say? But that's, uh, that's certainly, uh, it would rule out family honor killings. And most honor killings are done by members of the family. So they would actually be uh, illegal in terms of Sharia too. Uh, the penalty for stealing is cutting one or two hands to the accused. Again, I don't know the details of how this developed, as we did say that um, there is dispute within Islam as to whether this is a metaphor for restrictive measures or whether it really means amputation. And it looks as though that, you know, there were different opinions at different times. I don't know enough about the details to know exactly how that conversation goes, uh, but that would be an interesting thing to look at historically and say, when was it applied? Was it applied? How was it applied? Was it both hands, was it one hand? Um, and then compare that with what's happening in Saudi Arabia now, which as we've seen, uh, probably isn't really uh, necessarily linked to the, to the long Islamic legal tradition. Are there laws which stem from the Torah? Um, <coughs> the, <coughs> sorry, Muslims would say there are laws that stem from God and some of them appear in the Torah and some of the same ones appear in the Quran. That would be an inside faith view. Uh, from our point of view, well, you could see that the Quran actually quotes eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth. So uh, from a non-Islamic point of view, we could probably say, yes, <laughs> certainly some traditions were apparently known to Muhammad and people at his time and seem to have been incorporated in the Quran. But Muslims wouldn't actually regard it that way. Uh, what about Jews are converted to Islam for all kinds of different reasons and Maimonides who influenced Islam and made it look like Judaism? I'm not sure that Maimonides influenced Islam and made it look like Judaism. Um, I don't think Muslims are very aware of Maimonides. Not terribly anyway. I don't know that he's had any influence on Islam. Um, he certainly learned from Muslim commentaries on Aristotle. That's where he got his philosophical knowledge from. He didn't actually read Aristotle in the original. He read medieval Islamic commentaries and that's where he got a huge amount of his philosophy from. And the person you want to read uh, for a study of that is Herbert Davidson, who's looked at that in enormous detail. Um, but uh, Jews are converted to Islam. Um, when you say, what about them? I'm not quite sure what you're asking. Uh, so if you want to rephrase the, the, uh, the, the question, I'm happy to try it again. Does a person need to have ordination to be a cleric in a mosque? Nobody needs any qualification whatsoever to lead prayer. And the sort of courtesy title is Imam. Whether they've actually done any study rather than just, you know, what a bald filler would do, i.e leading enough times till they know how to do it. That's, uh, that's another question. So um, 
certainly in the UK, a lot of imams are don't actually have qualifications and uh, weren't born in the UK and have difficulty com uh, communicating with their congregations. So there's quite a movement to train imams properly locally, and there are various um, institutions that have been set up. There's a there's a there's a big one in Cambridge actually. <clears throat> uh, uh, what's called the, the Cambridge Muslim College, I think it is, which uh, is trying to up the level of education of local imams. So somebody called an imam might or might not have formal ijaza from somebody. Probably not. Um, on the other hand, uh, they might. They might. And again, within the Muslim community, you'll, people will probably know who are the trusted scholars they can go to for proper decisions rather than uh, somebody's uncle who does a lot of praying and thinks they know everything. Um, again, does Sharia mention homosexuality at all? Uh, I don't know. I'm not actually sure. I'd have to look it up. Uh, again, there's quite a lot of modern work on Islam and homosexuality, so uh, you could probably find material quite easily. Uh, just look for academic material, not extremist material, which will say it's forbidden, it's wicked, kill them all. Uh, but, you know, you might want to look at you might want to look at um, academic assessments of earlier discussions of it. I can tell you that, the, that uh, homosexuality was, um, it existed at some of the courts of Muslim Spain, for instance, there, were, there was a long poetic tradition of writing um, poems to pretty boys, uh, which also existed in Jewish poetry at the same time. So uh, yes, it seems to be a cultural thing. I don't know if it was, um, I don't know if that means it was permitted, but it was certainly a cultural phenomenon that Jews picked up on at the time as well. And if you look at some of the classic medieval uh, verse by Jews, some of it is definitely same sex, no question at all, which uh, including some quite um, prominent rabbinic figures. And then the question is, was that practical or was it just a, you know, a, a convention of literature? So that, that's another question. Uh, Raymond Scheindlin uh, is, is written on this. Uh, I think there's one called Wine, Women and Song. It's about medieval Jewish poetry. He's written at least two books, probably more. On, on medieval Jewish poetry and its links with contemporary Islamic poetry. Uh, any, other, any other questions? Nope. Oh, my heavens, I obviously explained everything for <laughs> once in my life. Okay, <laughs> so next week we're going to look at uh, Sufism, the mystical dimension of Islam. We'll discuss that. And then the last week we're going to look at questions of hijab and uh, women's wear and compare that a bit with Judaism because it's quite a big issue in both religions at the moment. So see you then. Thank Bye -bye. you so much. Looking forward. <laughs>